You are a general on the battlefield. Your mission is simple. Get your army from your starting point to your target fortress. You can only march your troops right or up. But there's a catch. Another general is moving at the same time and your supply lines cannot cross, not even by an inch. Any overlap means war. How many ways are there for both of you to reach your targets without starting a war? The idea behind this solution is so clever that it opens up an entire new way of thinking in math. Let's start with just one general. You can go right, right, right five times, then up, up, up five times, or we can go right, up, right, up, right, up, or we can take some completely random path. There are so many different paths. How could we possibly count all of them without missing any? Let's call each right move R and up move U. We can represent every path by a sequence of 10 letters, five R's and five U's. So this path is R, R, U, R, U, 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 R, R. Every arrangement of these 10 letters corresponds to a unique path. So all we have to do is count the number of rearrangements of these letters to count the number of paths. So all we have to do is figure out how many ways there are to rearrange these 10 letters in a line. Essentially, we have 10 blanks and have to select five of them to be R's. How many ways are there to select five R's out of these 10 blanks? Well, that's just 10 choose five, which is equal to 10 factorial over 5 factorial over 10 minus 5 factorial, which is 252. So there's 252 paths. Ah! There is now a sinkhole. How many ways can we reach the target without falling into it? Hmm, this is tricky. Rather than counting the number of paths that do not include the sinkhole, let's try counting the number of paths that do include the sinkhole and subtracting that count from the 252 total paths we already know. To count this, let's find the number of paths from the starting position to the sinkhole and sinkhole to target and multiply these counts together. Overall, this will give us the total number of paths that pass through a sinkhole. Let's first find the number of paths from the starting point to the sinkhole. There are four R's and two U's, so we use the same logic as earlier. Six blanks, we're choosing four R's. That's six choose four, and six factorial over four factorial over two factorial equals 15. Now, let's find the number of paths from the sinkhole to our target. There are one R, three U's, so there's going to be four choose one, which is just four ways. Multiplying this together, we get 60. 60 bad paths, 252 total paths. We have 192 paths that avoid the sinkhole. Now, the top half of the grid is forbidden. You can go on to this line y equals x, but you can't go over it. Now, how many ways are there? Well, let's try applying the same strategy of counting our bad paths and subtracting from our total paths. In the previous case, we would expect most of the 252 paths to work because it was just one place we were not allowed to go to. But in this case, it's an entire half of the grid. Chances are we're gonna pass through it at some point or another. So how can we possibly count the number of such paths? Well, there's a really neat trick. Any bad path will intersect with this yellow line. And the idea here is now, what if you replace all of the part of the path after crossing the yellow line and reflect that all over the yellow line onto a new grid, a four by six grid. Let's try for a different path now. We can do the exact same thing. The moment it hits the yellow line, the part of the path after that, reflect it over the yellow line onto this four by six grid. Any such bad path 
that will pass through our forbidden zone, imagine we reflect the second half of that path onto a new grid, a four by six grid. And this will work for any path that passes through our forbidden zone. We can just take it, take the part of the path after crossing the yellow line and reflect it onto our new grid. And the key thing here is that any path that goes in our orange grid, we can reflect it back over the yellow line to form a bad path. So we've done this in both directions. We've shown that any bad path in our original grid can be reflected to form a path in our orange grid and that any orange grid path can be reflected to form a bad path in our original grid. Therefore, the counts of both of these are the same. So the number of bad paths is just the number of paths on our orange grid from our starting point to the top right corner on the orange grid. Now we can count this by noting that there are four R's and six U's in our total path. So the number of ways is 10 choose four. There are 10 total moves. We have to select four of them to be R's. So the number of bad paths is just 10 choose four. But let's rewrite 252 as 10 choose five. Notice something interesting here. Let's take a look at the fraction 10 choose four divided by 10 choose five. If we evaluate this out, we cancel out 10 factorial, then five factorial, then four factorial. We end up with a surprisingly simple number, five, six. Now let's plug in five over six times 10 choose five into our expression for 10 choose four. This is nothing but one six times 10 choose five, which is 42. And notice that in general, we can extend this pattern. Imagine we didn't just have a five by five grid, but a n by n grid. The number of such paths that will always stay diagonal or below. We can count that using the Catalan numbers. And as you can see here, it's very similar. One over five plus one times 10 choose five, one over n plus one times two n choose n. Isn't that so cool? Now we're back to our main problem. Two generals, how many ways can they reach their targets without crossing paths? Imminent war. We can use the same strategy we've been using. Find the total number of paths and subtract off the bad or intersecting paths. In this case though, the total number of paths is a bit more tricky. We first start by finding the total number of paths for green to reach the target. There's five right moves, four up moves, so in total we have nine moves, and the number of ways to do this path is the same as selecting five of these nine moves to be right. So nine choose five. Same thing for the red, five right moves, four up moves. Total number of ways to select this, nine choose five. So in total, the number of total paths, not worrying about this intersection condition at all, nine choose five times nine choose five. But now this is the tricky part. How do we find how many paths where they intersect, the bad paths. There's a really neat way we can count the number of bad paths. The trick is very similar to what we use for the Catalan numbers. First of all, let's extend the paths from our intersection point. Let them fully reach their targets. Of course, this is an invalid path. So here's the idea. Notice that for every sequence of paths that do intersect, we can flip them about the pivot point so that now it's a reverse path from the green starting point to the red target, from the red starting point to the green target. But do every one of these flipped paths correspond to an intersecting path in our original case? Yes. It turns out that in our flipped paths, they will always intersect. Take a look here. Let's imagine we straighten out our paths. Clearly they intersect. So of course, when we roughen them out, add a little bit of edges to it, they will still intersect. So we know that our flip paths will always intersect. And now what we do is we just take the first intersection points of these paths and we flip it back to get an intersecting path of our original paths. So all we have to do to count that bad paths term we were looking for, we have to find the number of paths from our green starting point to the red target point. Well, five R's, five U's, 10 total moves, 
select five of them to be right, same logic we've been doing, 10 choose five. Now, from the red starting point to the green target point. Five right moves, three up moves, that's eight choose three of these paths. So in total, the number of these flip paths, or equivalently as we've established, which is the same number as the number of bad paths in our original case, that's just going to be 10 choose five times eight choose three. So overall, our expression is now nine choose five times nine choose five minus 10 choose five times eight choose three. Then notice something interesting about this. This looks exactly like the determinant of a two by two matrix. A two by two matrix with first row, nine choose five and 10 choose five and second row, eight choose three and nine choose five. Now let's replace our choose expressions with our more general paths. So nine choose five, that's just the number of paths from the green starting point to our green target. 10 choose five, the number of paths from our green starting point to our red target. And eight choose three is the number of paths from our red starting point to our green bullseye. And nine choose five is the number of paths from our red starting point to our red bullseye. So essentially, the determinant of this two by two matrix is just the number of non-intersecting paths we've been looking to count. And the crazy thing about this is it generalizes beyond just the points we've chosen. We can move around our starting points. We can move around our bullseyes. It doesn't matter. The number of non-intersecting paths is always going to be just this determinant with one key condition to remember. So let's imagine drawing some lanes between these paths. So imagine a lane between the red starting point and the red target, the green starting point and the green target. Essentially, as long as we can divide it up into these lanes for the red starting point, red target, green starting point, green target, this determinant will indeed count the number of non-intersecting paths. Now let's explore an example where maybe this isn't the case. Take a look here. Our lanes overlap, it's not possible. And in fact, as you might guess, there are zero non-intersecting paths in this case. And that's really what's cool about this determinant. If you evaluate the determinant for this case, if the determinant is ever zero or negative, then it turns out it's impossible to have a non-intersecting path. If our lane condition is satisfied, the number of non-intersecting paths is counted by the determinant of this two by two matrix, where the product of the number of paths on our main diagonal, what we're adding, is the number of total paths, and the product of our B and C terms essentially, this is the number of bad paths. But the crazy thing is, it does not stop at just two paths. We can generalize this to more. How can we try attempting that? First, let's try and categorize what we are seeing in this determinant here. We have our green starting points and red starting points on the left for our rows, and our green target and red targets for our columns. Now, let's try expanding this. Let's imagine we have another general, an orange general. Now, how many ways are there for the three generals such that no two of their paths will ever cross? And it turns out, just like we had this two by two matrix, we can count this with a three by three matrix. But just like earlier, remember, for this determinant to work, we need to be able to divide them into separate lanes. Like in this case, for example, we can indeed do that. So non-intersecting paths will actually exist. And it turns out we can expand our two by two matrix to form a three by three matrix. Imagine for our rows, we add another row for our orange starting point. And imagine for our columns, we add another column for our orange target. Now let's fill in the rest of the matrix with the same pattern we've been following. It turns out with a separate lane condition we mentioned earlier, this three by three matrix will indeed count the number of paths such that no two intersect. 
Now, why is this true? Well, the proof of this is beyond the scope of this video, but I'll try to give you some intuition as to why it's true. So let's start by looking at the main diagonal of this matrix, the product of the number of paths from green start to green target, red start to red target, orange start to orange target. That is the total number of paths possible, ignoring any intersection condition. But of course, there's a reason we have an entire matrix for this. What happens when two paths cross? Well, let's imagine the orange and red paths are the ones that cross. So let's try applying the same logic we applied for the 2x2 two two case. Swapping at the first intersection point. Now notice what happens when we do this. The number of paths in this new configuration with our swap paths for orange and red, which will basically count the number of paths where the orange and red intersect, this is just another product in the expansion of our matrix. The entry where we multiply, take a look here, the green to the green target paths, and now we're multiplying by this entire two by two matrix here. And one term here, which is negative, is a term red start to orange target, orange start to red target. This term is negative, and as you can see here, we are overcounting it as part of our main diagonal count, that count for the total number of paths ignoring the intersection condition. And it turns out when the red and green paths intersect, we can do something very similar. Exact same thing here. We swap the paths about the first intersection point. Now notice that this is another product in the expansion of our matrix. We have green to red target, red to green target, and orange to orange target. And this principle we've been discussing, it turns out to be a famous lemma in the field of algebraic combinatorics, the LGV lemma, which I probably cannot pronounce. This grid where we can only move right or up turns out to be an example of what's known as a directed acyclic graph. What that means is the LGV lemma can generalize from just a square grid to any general graph as long as we're headed in some general direction like up and right for our square grid. Thanks for watching. Hope you learned something new today.